Heavenly Father, we open our spirits to the ministry of the Word that you have to continue this day. And our prayer simply is this, that we will be given ears to hear and hearts to receive that which you have for us. May the blessed Holy Spirit perform his ministry in this hour. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to show you how to implement the experience that you have, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and begin to live and act according to the purpose for which you've been called. God isn't pouring out his Spirit just so we can have an experience and say, when we get to heaven, well, praise God, I got the baptism. I was saved and filled with Spirit. How about you? But he is pouring out his Spirit that his church might function effectually in this hour. And it can't, it isn't, hasn't been doing it for centuries. But some are beginning to. We just happen to be one of those who believe in and teach body ministry. That's why, as I said yesterday, we've written a book on it because most people do not realize that the church that Jesus Christ established was a church where the whole body functioned charismatically. And that the various gifts that Paul enumerates in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 are people he's talking about. Some are hands, feet, eyes. He means, as he says, some are prophecy. Some are tongues, interpretation, word of knowledge. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So God in this hour, as we told you, is pouring out his spirit. He's restoring three things, essentially three things. The apostolic experience, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Apostolic ministry, which is a ministry by the whole body of Christ, our entire church functions. I wouldn't know what it was if they saved up any sick till I got back from our meetings. They don't save the sick up. If I want to pray for anybody, I have to get in line. I take my turn. Deliverance or whatever, they count it a privilege to function in the body. And they have learned because I've taught them that God is no respecter of persons. And that what happens in my ministry can happen to the least member of the church. That is, if they consider themselves that little finger or something. But before that ministry can function, the apostolic ministry that God intends to restore, and he's going to do it, whether or not some of us are ready for it or even are interested in it, if we're satisfied with remaining spectators in Christianity, isn't going to change the fact that God is preparing an army of overcomers. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is only the doorway to a great anointing that's yet coming on the matured sons of God that he's going to send forth and deliver this groaning creation from its corruption and bondage. Ever read Romans 8? It's there. But before, as I say, that ministry can work, there has to be a restoration of the thing that makes it work. James says the body without spirit is dead, and he also says faith without works is dead. And we can say the body of Christ without faith is dead. So God is restoring apostolic faith. Faith is not a doctrine. A doctrine can't save, heal, deliver, meet any need with God. But faith is very practical. Feeds you when you're hungry, heals you when you're sick, saves the lost, fulfills the commission, protects you, delivers you. That's what faith is all about. Faith is bringing Christ down because he said, where two of you are believing something, he says, I'm there in a special way. He said, these signs will follow those who have faith. He says, you can do what I did. You just stand in my place and use my name, and there am I. I'm doing it through you. That's what faith is, a very real, dynamic thing. It's in the heart of God that you have faith, and without faith you can't please him, Hebrews 11.6. We're not talking about what the church, institutional church, means by faith, getting your soul saved, and then sit in a pew as a sick spectator waiting to get raptured waiting to die, really, so that you can go to heaven. But we're talking about faith as the dynamic, the empowering by which we function and fulfill the purpose for which he's baptizing us in the Spirit. You see, God has made us rich. Everything belongs to us. I'm not just talking about material riches, but I could start there because that's where most of us lack. In fact, 
I generally don't even start there the first or second day so that I don't turn half the audience off because most of us have been taught the wrong things for so long. We've been brainwashed into believing. And I know why you believe it, because I taught it for 14 years. That God somehow is displeased if we ever get out of debt and walk in health. That isn't very spiritual, not to owe somebody. And to have to pray three or four times, get the old card at the meeting so you can arrive on time. That's how you get more spiritual. And then I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and found out that what I was teaching was manology and not theology. In the First Corinthians 3, 20 and 22, among many other passages, says that God has given us all things and he expects us to claim all things, to enter into our inheritance now so that we can begin to function as disciples person who spends half their time in bed sick cannot even function in the kingdom of God. And a person who has to spend all of his time begging and pleading for God to meet his finances and help him make ends meet has no time to pray about important things. I don't spend one minute a year praying about financial needs. And God supplies so abundantly I have to find places to give it away. That's Matthew 6, 19 to 34. It's been there all along. He says five times, don't you even take a thought for your material needs. And he said, I'll take thought for you. You know, I discovered that about a day after he saved me when I was going bankrupt and I didn't have a lot of choice. It was either go bankrupt or trust God and his word. And you know, I didn't find that a difficult decision to make. I have people all the time running to me and say, what should I do about this and that? I know the word of God says this or that about healing or finances or getting your loved ones saved. But you know, really, aren't there some exceptions? Is that for today? And so on and so forth and et cetera and et cetera and et cetera. And I just tell them, well, if he said it, you've got nothing to lose to believe it and watch it come to pass. So. I, I didn't feel that was a big decision to make. I didn't have to go ask the pastor, what should I do? Should I trust God or go bankrupt? I just trusted God and I didn't go bankrupt. And it's been working for 22 years ever since. The wisdom of God, friends, far exceeds that of the church. You better believe it. <laughs> God help us if it doesn't. But it does. And God knows. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, I don't want you taking a single thought for your material needs because that takes thought away from the kingdom. And since I don't spend one moment a year worrying or being concerned about or even asking about material things, then look at all the time that I have released to pray about and minister in and for and to the kingdom of God. And even though I may battle symptoms and have to go through some physical trials, I never have ever canceled a meeting. Therefore, I continue to function by faith. And God time and again touches me in a meeting. You know, I have to walk it out just, just like you do. Somehow some people think, one woman said to me, you mean you have trials too with all the faith you're talking about? Well, I said, yes, that's how you get it, by the way. <laughs> Which is James chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into those divers' trials. King James says temptations. It isn't something to be joyful about to fall into temptation. But the Greek says trials. Begin to rejoice because your faith is coming to maturity. That is, if you endure them. I want to set forth five conditions to receive the promises of God. I've got them set forth in the first chapter of my book on faith, but what's there I'm not going to be giving you today. That, I'm just saying that in case you don't remember the five conditions to receive whatever God has promised you in the Word. It's there for you to see. Now, <clears throat> I say there are five conditions because there are five. They're not four or six. And try as you may, you're not going to reduce them to less than five or increase them to more than five. There are five because there are five essential things we have to do to get an answer from God. But today I want to give you five things that I'll guarantee you on the authority of the Word of God. If you will do these things, you'll become a recipient of the literally hundreds and hundreds of promises that God has set in His Word, given them to His church, for they are the divine resources by which we're going to function, walk in victory, 365 days a year and fulfill God's purpose. The promises are not there, friends, just to teach in Sunday school or to read for your daily Bible readings. These are the divine resources 
by which God says, I'm going to show you how to overcome Satan. I'm going to show you how to get the victory here. I'm going to show you how to walk in health and in prosperity. And all of the things that I have promised you, I want you to start believing and appropriating. God has made us rich mentally, spiritually, physically, materially in every way. Most Christians are poverty stricken, body, mind, soul, and spirit in every way. But God has made us rich. And he wants us to function as disciples and no longer as witnesses against him and his word. The average Christian is a witness against God and his word and doesn't realize it. By his complaint, you don't dare ask him, as I said, how do you feel? How are you? That's just a common friendly greeting. You get a complete medical history. They're complaining, they're confessing the wrong things and so on. We want to set you free this week if we can. And uh, I'm going to believe that we can, at least some of you. That's being positive, isn't it? There are five things to do. Now, these things work. They've worked hundreds of times in my life in ministry. They've worked thousands of times in our church, faith assembly. They have worked tens of thousands of times all over the land where God sends us and people get a hold of these principles. You must, first of all, ground your faith in the Word of God. You must secondly claim by faith what you need or what you're willing to believe for or whatever God requires you to do. And it takes faith to do it, by the way. You must confess that you have it before you see it or feel it. Thirdly, you must be willing to act in harmony with what you're saying. A lot of people don't. Oh, praise God, I got prayed for last night and I believe I'm healed. By the way, where are my pills? I think it's time to take another. We're talking about acting on your faith. And fifthly, you must be willing. Some of you say, I could have left the fourth point out. The way you look, some of you, I believe you're thinking that. I'm not going to water down the fact, friends. I'll give you the fifth one in a moment. I'm not going to water down about uh, the fact that God sets forth in his word divine healing. And what 90% of charismatics believe in and teach that I have run into in the past almost eight years is a modified version of medical healing, which I used to teach and believe in. I'm going to be talking about divine healing this week. Divine healing is nothing but God. Would you believe God doesn't need pills to heal you? Well, praise the Lord. There are some friends here. And fifthly, that you must be willing to hold fast to your confession of faith without doubting until the answer has been manifested, made visible, has come. Well, I said, first of all, you've got to ground your faith in the Word of God. These are five essential conditions because, do you know why? Because your faith can't rise above the level of what you know, K-N-O-W. God has promised to do for you in the Word. Go ahead and try to believe for something He hasn't promised you and see where you get Every day that I speak, I'm going to be stressing this in one form or another. You can't get away from the fact that faith will be no greater than your knowledge. Not what the commentaries say or what you learned in Bible school or the seminary, but your knowledge of what God has said he will do. And many times that contradicts the commentaries and the seminaries. Contradicts what I taught for 14 years in the seminary and in the churches. Much of what God says. You'd be surprised what God says when you get the Holy Spirit, what you can see that He says. This is why, dear friends, we stress the teaching, the need of teaching today, more than the need of getting prayed for. And I'm all for that because when the Lord anoints to pray, we pray for people and we've stopped praying for people until He does. Because we found many times we've been premature. Generally, if I'm in a meeting for eight days, I pray the last night for the sick. And I have already promised the people that if they will come every night and hear the word, a lot will be healed sitting there and the others will be healed when they come for prayer. I can guarantee that because it isn't Hobart Freeman or anyone else that heals anybody. Psalm 107, 20, God sends his word to heal. People get very restless when they have to listen for an hour and a half or two hours to teaching, seven or eight nights. But those who will endure it, praise God. You might be surprised what takes place inside. It just happens. 
Time and time again that we have seen this, I'll say more about that in a later message of how the importance of that word is to healing, and often you can get healed just sitting there. I would be surprised if some of you didn't get healed this week. I mean, it would come as a surprise if it didn't happen, because it always does happen. That is, you hear the word, something happens. Well, this is what we're stressing. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing the word. You don't get it by praying. You don't get it by asking for it or begging or pleading. You get faith by hearing the word. And that means hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word. Because your faith always parallels what you know about the word. It never advances beyond what you know God has said he will do. Now, it isn't just enough to know a promise. You have to know how to appropriate those promises. Gold doesn't lie on the surface of the ground. You can get the garbage or the trinkets there, but the gold, you have to dig for it. It's down deep. And, and what God has for us, my friends, he's just not going to scatter on the surface of the ground. He's going to give to those who will pay the cost of sitting under the word, getting out and hearing it like you're doing, for example. I mean, there are a lot of important things a lot of you could be doing, but you found this to be important to get out to this seminar. And so our faith cannot rise above the level of what we know God has promised either specifically or in principle in his word. A specific promise is like Matthew 6.33 that I cited. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he said, I'll meet every material need you have. You won't even have to take thought for it. That's a specific promise. I've been walking on that one for 22 years. A faith principle is like Mark 11.24 that we cited yesterday. What things soever you desire. You see, he didn't specify what it was, but whatever you desire. When you pray, believe you have received and you'll have it. Amen. I went to Israel on that one. Got the money. Didn't say a thing about going to Israel. He said, whatever you desire. And I desired it to go. I desired to go and I went. John 14, 14 is another faith principle. If you ask anything, see, not specifying something. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I saw my mother saved on that. You'd be surprised what's in the Word if you will just believe it and appropriate it. Some people have the ridiculous notion that faith is something, you know, hard or difficult to get a hold of and grasp. But as we showed you, God has said he's already given every one of you sufficient faith to move any mountain in your life. Rather than waiting for a mountain of faith to move your mustard seeds, he says a mustard seed of faith will move every mountain in your life. We have the notion, so many of us, that the apostles and prophets were somehow endowed with a supernatural kind of faith that isn't available to us. If you'll turn over to James 5, I want to show you that that isn't what the Word of God says. Do you know that you can have, in fact, you already have the same faith as Elijah? Now, his was greater than maybe yours, or most of you, maybe not all of you. No reason to think that it would be true of all of you. His faith may have been greater, but the only reason it was because he used it and it grows through use. It's a fruit that grows. Faith is a fruit. We're not talking about the gift of faith this week. Probably won't even mention it except just now. I'm talking about the fruit of faith, Galatians 5, which every one of us have. Romans 12, 3, God has given to every man the measure of faith. Every Christian has faith. But do you think of faith as something that the apostles and prophets had that, you know, just somehow accidentally is given to some people it may be in the 20th century that it wouldn't be available to you. I want to encourage you to believe this afternoon, friends, that the same faith that Elijah had, you've already got if you'll just use it. Now, here is the passage in James 5, beginning with verse 14, about healing the sick. Passage familiar to every charismatic. We don't have to read it all. Just notice verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now look at this. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick sometimes if it's my will and if it isn't too hard of a case. Well, that's the way the church believes it, so we might as well read it that way. That isn't what he said. He said the prayer of faith will heal the sick. He didn't say sometimes. He didn't say some diseases. He even went on to say, and the Lord will raise him up. Now, you can't convince God you believe John 3.16 and you don't believe this. You really can't. We can make it stronger than that, but we don't uh, intend to lose any <laughs> disciples the first or second day. 
we could eat, we could say what we won't say, like you have no assu- you have no assurance you're saved if you don't believe this. But we'll save that for later. All right. He said the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Now who's he talking to? The church. And look at this. Verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to the same weaknesses. The Greek says weaknesses, not passions. Weaknesses as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again and the heaven gave rain. And the earth brought forth her fruit. Why do you suppose he stuck a subject in there that has absolutely nothing to do with divine healing. Because it has everything to do with it. Because the church of the first century is not any different than the church of the 20th century. At this point, everybody, half of the people are more are running around saying, I can never have that kind of faith. And God says, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And I said, look at Elijah. A man of great faith. He could command the heavens to close. And it rained not for three and a half years. And he prayed again by faith. And the heavens gave the rain. And he said he's a man, not an angel, not somewhere between God and man. He's just a man like you. And he's subject, he said, to the same weaknesses you are. Remember when he ran from Jezebel? I have a hard time figuring out with all of his faith why he did, but then I wasn't there. He had just won a great battle on Mount Carmel, a battle of faith. And I don't have time to recount it, but that was tremendous faith. After he watered down the sacrifice, then he said the Lord will consume it by fire. And God says here, don't you tell yourself you can't pray the prayer of faith. He said the greatest prophet of faith than Elijah was in the Old Testament was no different than you. Well, we're here to encourage you, friends, not to watch us, but to participate. Hallelujah. You are no different. Faith is not some supernatural endowment given to Elijah or Hobart Freeman. Since he has given me this ministry, it is not the gift of faith we're talking about. That does operate occasionally. But my friends, it doesn't take a bit of effort to believe for the impossible when the gift of faith is operating. You couldn't doubt if you tried. That's why he gives you the gift. He said one time, go into such and such a hospital room, tell the boy he's saved and healed. Don't ask his opinion, just tell him. God's God, now you'll have to leave room for him doing it his way. I don't see him in the book of Acts asking the apostle Paul his opinion. He just said one day to Paul, that's far enough. He said, you're a chosen vessel. Well, praise God. That's the God of the Bible. Maybe it not be the God of some of the churches and Arminianism and manology and all of that. But that's the gift of faith. And I went in and just did that. And I couldn't have doubted if I'd have tried. I just said, Lord, as I went in the hospital, I'm going to watch you work out what you said you were going to do. And he did exactly that. The boy lay there ready to cut his arm off. Said, God wants to save you, wants to heal you. Well, he said, I've been believing it for two days. Let's go. Gift of faith. We're talking about the fruit of faith, friends that we all have. It's all alike. Mine is no different from yours. I've got great faith. It'd be ridiculous to say that I didn't. Why have a minister of faith if you're afraid to believe for the impossible? We've commanded the heavens to cease its rain and watched it do it and so on. But why come and entertain you about the gift of faith? We're telling you that what we've got is what you can have. And what you've already got can increase more. And how is it going to happen? It's going to happen through this word in no other way. Now it isn't just listening to this word. It isn't just the bare hearing of it. It's hearing the word as God spoke it and what he requires, what conditions he sets forth, and putting those into practice. Now I'm spending all this time on this first condition for a good reason. I won't spend that much time on all five or we wouldn't get through in time till 730 But let me give you an example. I was speaking in a Baptist church several years ago after I became charismatic. I got a phone call from a former acquaintance, Baptist pastor. He said, hey, I hear something has happened to you. By the way, God supernaturally revealed he was going to call and what he was going to say. But that's another question. So we're not talking about those gifts working. We're talking about faith. 
the fruit of faith. And he said, uh, he said, I've heard something's happened to you. I said, yes, I found out Jesus is alive. <laughs> you know, I believed it for 14 years, and then when I received the Holy Spirit, in fact, I want to tell you, friends, there in that seminary in Chicago, the very moment I began to speak in new tongues, when I received the baptism, the first thought in my mind, I've believed it for 14 years, now I know it. He's at the right hand of God, and as Acts 2.32 says, He sent forth this, which you now see and hear. It's a knowledge. There's a knowing. That's what faith is. It's a knowing. You can get saved by believing John 3.16, but I'll tell you it's something else to know John 3.16 is true. And that's one reason the Holy Spirit is given, so you can know it. Hallelujah. I said, so I found out Jesus alive, and I told him what I meant by that. He said, well, our church is dead. I'm dead, and I've been praying, Lord, if you don't do something, something's got to happen. I've got to get out of the ministry. There has to be more to Christianity than this. I said, brother, there is. He said, will you come and tell us about it? I said, I'd be happy to. So for 11 days, we told him about it. He couldn't even wait till the Sunday night service to get filled with the Spirit. He got it in his bedroom. But that, that isn't why I'm telling you that. One of his deacons came Wednesday. They were coming each night and receiving the Holy Spirit in that Baptist church. It kind of became charismatic before the week was out. And <laughs> a deacon came Wednesday, received the Holy Spirit, and after the service he said, Let me tell you. He said, I'm a good Baptist, and uh, Sunday morning when you were here teaching on this charismatic outpouring and all this, he said, Naturally, a Baptist knows that that isn't for today. So he said, I just... Uh, just turned me off, but he said, I'm a member here, deacon, so I came back Sunday night. And uh, still, of course, he knew better than something that happened emotional to me, I guess he thought, but there wasn't anything to this. And he said, but since I'm a member here, I just kept coming since we had a meeting going. And he said, you just kept laying out the scriptural evidence and night after night, night after night. He said, by Wednesday, the scriptural evidence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit was so overwhelming, I just quit fighting it and came and got it. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what we're trying to tell you, friends, share with you. The scriptural evidence is what we're talking about because your faith can't rise above the level of what you know God has said in His Word. Let me give you another example. You see, everything you receive from God is by faith. Everything. Now name something you don't. You can't. Everything that comes from God is by faith. And today there is the popular but unscriptural notion that God sends sickness to bless us and for His glory. And uh, somehow we're going to have to get rid of that notion because there's just the unhappy prospect for most Christians of an endless round of going to doctors, taking drugs, submitting to surgery. I've had all of that. I've tried that way. The painless cure is much better. But we're going to have to get the word into Christians before they'll ever be delivered from the idea that, that this isn't normal Christian living. This is quite abnormal, being sick and poverty-stricken and defeated all the time. You ought to be able to walk in victory 365 days a year. Did I tell you that's the subtitle to one of my books? <laughs> Hallelujah. Positive thinking and confession. That's the key. You think not? Carry one of those little tape recorders on your, you know, one of those little deals on the side, like a purse or something. Turn it on when you get up of a morning. Then play it back to yourself before you go to bed, and you won't believe it. You say, that isn't me. Why, no wonder I'm always sick. How could I ever get out of debt? Listen to what I said. Did I really say that? And so Christians are defeating themselves with what they think and what they say. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's the way God has made us. Would you believe medical science and psychiatrists discovered that about 75 years ago, and they're just using that to the greatest advantage to help their patients? There are just some people doctors refuse to treat today because they can't get them to change their way of thinking. They're hypochondriacs and a few other kind of icks and ticks and acts because they think they have to be sick, and so on and so forth. Well, so we have to get Christians today into the Word to deliver them of that notion they have to be sick or poverty-stricken or have to beg and plead for God to bless them and to prove His love to them. He's waiting to demonstrate it. 
And if we can get you into the Word this week, you'll see, for example, that sickness is from the devil, never from God. Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, and he went about doing good, healing all who were being blessed by God with a cancer. <laughs> healing all, listen to it, who were oppressed of the devil. Sickness is an oppression of the devil. You get into that same word, you read something like Psalm 103 and verse 3. He forgives all of our iniquities and he heals some of our diseases. Well, I quote it that way, friends, because I want to show you how ridiculous it is. When you just hear it quoted the way most people believe it. No, he says, I forgive all your iniquities and heal all your diseases. And if all of your iniquities are not forgiven, you're still in darkness your sins are not forgiven. You're not in the kingdom. And the word in the Hebrew is all in both clauses of that verse. All your iniquities are forgiven and all of your diseases are healed. I used to wonder what in the world we were ever going to do with those verses when we ran into them in the Hebrew. I used to teach Hebrew and they bothered me. Like Isaiah 53, 4. doesn't say what King James said about it. The Hebrew says he... Surely he has carried away our diseases and borne away our pains. That's what the Word says. I used to say, what in the world are we going to do with that? Baptists don't believe that. So we didn't do anything with it. But when you get that Word to working, my friends, you'll find out that you don't have to wait to get healed. You were healed at Calvary. It's in the atonement. And you can begin to enter into your inheritance. Now, whether or not you always get immediate manifestations will come out this week. If you keep coming, you'll see that's one of the conditions of accepting the answer is done when you pray and then letting God be the manifester of that answer in his own time and way, whether it's a moment or a month. Sometimes, like Betty Baxter, it may be several years. Our Hobart Freeman, the Lord healed me of one condition. I had polio. As a child, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he said, you're healed. I mean, friends, vision and dream at least a dozen times. It's been confirmed. But he hasn't manifested it yet. He said, you be an example of what you preach. You tell those people, my people, Mark 11, 24, has to be worked out in every person's life I'm going to use in this end time. You know what Mark 11, 24 is? It's the key to the whole message of faith God has given us. I've quoted it several times. Listen to it again. What things soever you desire when you pray, not when it's manifested, not when you feel better, not when the circumstances improve, not when your loved ones are saved. When you pray, believe. You have received. Past tense, the Greek says, and you shall have it. Now anybody without an education can tell there are two tenses in that verse. Believe you have received and you shall receive. Past and future. Oh, it's so plain. But we need teachers to teach us how plain and simple God has made it. And he said, you go up and down the land and you tell them there are no exceptions to my promises. But there are conditions. And if they don't receive the answer, it's as simple as two times two makes four. They either didn't believe or they didn't meet the condition. No other reasons. You'll, you'll search in vain. You can read the Scriptures from cover to cover. There will be only two reasons why you don't receive what God has promised if you ask Him. You either didn't believe it. And my friends, believing is not what we think. Faith is not what the average person has a concept of. You'd be surprised how many people said, I believe, didn't get an answer, and they weren't even on believing ground. You've got to get on some believing ground before you can start getting some of these blessings. You might be surprised what's required to get everything that God says He would give and do for you. Well, anyway, if we get in the Word, the Word is going to do it. So it isn't a matter of what people are saying or what the commentaries say. If God says it, it's going to come to pass if everything else contradicts it. The Word will heal even if you couldn't read it. It would heal you if you just listened to it. Valdez tells of a man that, well, he was an alcoholic, developed tuberculosis, He's the one that led him to Jesus. He ended up in a hospital, and he knew about him somehow and went up there and told him the simple gospel story and had blessed his heart so much. 
He just wanted to die and go home with the Lord. He was dying anyway. It was a matter of a few days. And Valdez led him to Jesus. And some members of the church, he said, went up after he was saved uh, to encourage him. And one of them told him, said, why, the same word that saved you, saved you will heal you. It's in the same atonement. I just quoted to you Isaiah 53 and verse 4 is the Old Testament prophecy of the atonement of how Jesus bore away not only your sins but your sicknesses at Calvary. In fact, he says three or four times he bore away your sicknesses and diseases before he even mentions bearing away your sins. Now, I didn't write that chapter. God did, so you'll have to take it up with him. We're always taught how what is more important. God doesn't divide us up into body and spirit like we do. I don't mean that we don't have a spirit and a soul and a body, but he does not compartmentalize us like the theologians do. He saves and deals with the whole man, and you'll never, ever have a full gospel preached to you until the gospel of the resurrection of the body is preached to you because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if there be no resurrection of the body, then he says there's no gospel to preach. That's just how important your body is to God. He's going to raise it up. Praise God, it'll be a new one. But Paul says you've got to plant that one to get the new one. And so God doesn't divide us up and he told this brother, somebody told him the same word that saved you will heal you. Well, he didn't, he couldn't, oh, by the way, he couldn't read. Did I say that? He couldn't read. He was illiterate. And half the church visited him, and Valdez said no one knew what the others were doing, and everyone was bringing him a Bible. They didn't know he couldn't read. Well, since he couldn't read, he said he was just stacking them up by his bed on the floor. <laughs> and he was waiting for something because they told him the Word would heal. Now, being illiterate, he took it literally. I find sometimes it helps to be a little naive and illiterate. If you don't believe that, read 1 Corinthians 1. And so he picked those Bibles up one day when he had the stack high enough. He laid one on each ankle, one on each knee, one on his thighs, one on his stomach, one on his chest, one on each shoulder, one on his forehead, took one in each hand, said, Lord, I claim the rest of my inheritance. And just like that, the power of God hit that bed just like a bolt of lightning. And he came out of there and went out and began to preach. I think preached for 30, 40 years. Amen. You don't even have to be able to read this word if you just listen carefully, friends. You can get healed sitting there. In fact, you can get healed in some areas you probably don't even know you need healing. And a lot of times that's in the area of the intellect. Now, I can get away with saying that because I've got enough degrees to paper a wall, and I still say that you don't approach God with your intellect. And the reason we have this faith ministry because we're just as naive as we were 22 years ago when we were going bankrupt, and God said, you don't have to. Just trust me. I haven't changed a bit from that, friends. I've learned a lot more about faith, but I haven't changed. Amen. It's the Word of God. In fact, you can be healed a lot of times when the people praying for you don't believe it. It's the Word that heals, Psalm 107.20. Have I said enough about the Word? Well, let me give you just one other illustration. Larry came up to our church one time and I asked him to give his testimony, and he tells him that how that as an Episcopalian, this is before he received the Holy Spirit and before he knew too much about, I guess he didn't know anything about healing. He said he was literally dying in a hospital. Should have been dead 30 days before that. As he was telling us, he said, he said, one day as I lay there, he said, I should have been dead 30 days ago. They had tubes down me, and of course he said he had some sort of poison in his system and his stomach was distended, swollen way beyond normal. And... Uh, he said, as I lay there with the Bible on my lap, my knees propped up, he said, the Holy Spirit, because the windows were closed, the Holy Spirit began to move those pages, just blow them over like the wind. He went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and got way over there where no Episcopalian ever really gets. Baptist either, for that matter. In James 1, 2, 3, 4, stopped at the fifth chapter. I guess that's the first time he'd ever seen in his life. And he said he began to read it. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick. He said, I got on the phone, couldn't speak, had all those tubes in me, but I somehow got across to my wife, oil, the word oil. She put two and two together by the Holy Spirit. No other way she could figure it out. Called the Episcopal priest. He was out of town. The assistant was there, the assistant priest, and uh, he didn't believe a word of this 
divine healing bit. But she insisted that he go over and see her husband he, because he was dying. And as he walked in the room, the priest said, I want to tell you, I don't believe in this. He said, I don't believe in divine healing. I don't believe that's for today and so on and so forth. But said, after all, a dying man ought to be granted his last request. So he said, I'm going to do it on that basis. Well, I said I wasn't paying attention to him because I'd already agreed with God that when he touched my head, I was healed. Praise God. It isn't who prays for you. Judas prayed for people, friends. You don't read anything in the Bible about Judas being an exception, about baptizing people and praying for the sick and working miracles. He worked right along with the other twelve. If he hadn't, they'd have been the first to have noticed it. What's the matter with old Judas? He never gets anybody healed. Never see Judas leading anybody to the Lord. No, he was working right along. We've got them in the pulpits today who I could name some, and I know, I know firsthand some who have spirits of divination. It's not word of knowledge. I don't mean like everybody. I just say I know some. And people are getting healed under their ministry because they're believing something in spite of what the other believes. Now, I don't recommend you get prayed for by people like that. I'm just trying to make a point. I could tell you that some damage is sometimes done, allowing just anybody to pray for you. But anyhow, he said that I'd already covenanted with the Lord that I was going to be healed when he touched my head with that oil. And he said he didn't believe a word of it, but he took his oil out and says he touched my forehead. And as soon as he did, the same thing happened. He said the power of God hit that room, a great light from heaven shone around. said, knock that priest on his back. His prayer book went one direction, his glasses another. His head in another direction. He didn't know what hit him. The power of God. And he said he leaped up and grabbed his hat and glasses and prayer book. I don't know if they found him yet. Took off. <laughs> and he said immediately that stomach went down and I was healed. Praise God. It's the Word. He found it in the Word. And I said the second thing, the second condition, is that you must claim it after you see it. This is Matthew 7, 7. Matthew 7, 7. Jesus says, Everyone that asketh, receiveth. Matthew 7, 8. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. You've got to ask, friends. Salvation is promised to the sinner. He isn't saved because it's promised. He's saved if he asks. Do you know why I wasn't saved a day, a week, month, year sooner than I was? I was saved when I was 32. Do you know why I was not saved any sooner? It's not because I didn't believe it. I did believe it. I believed in Jesus Christ. I believed the Bible was the inspired Word of God. In fact, I discovered, after I went to some of these liberal schools, that I believe more as a lost person than some of the professors in the seminaries believe. Sad, but it's true. In fact, it's so bad, you don't want me to tell you how bad. Maybe we should, ought to tell you how bad, if you're putting your money into those things. The Baptist school I attended, it was so bad, the pastors of the city had me because my academic, well, the academic blessings God had given me, asked me to accumulate evidence because they were going to get rid of a lot of professors in that seminary. In fact, when I gathered the evidence, it was so hot they wouldn't touch it. It was that bad. Well, I learned by that, too, that people are not really willing to do what they say sometimes they are. But the point is, I believed it, but I wasn't saved. You know why I wasn't saved, even though I believed it? It's because I didn't appropriate it. Jesus said, everyone that asketh receiveth. And I wasn't ready to ask. I wanted to have my fun. I wanted to make my million. That's why I went in business. So God took away all of that so that I would turn my attention to spiritual values. But you've got to ask. You say, what can you ask for? It would be a lot easier this week for me to come and tell you what you can't ask for. I don't know where the limitations are because they're not in God. They're only in us. And I could just take one or two promises today and tell you what you could ask for, and some of you it would be like a new revelation to you to realize that there are no limitations at all in God. They're just in us. He said, all things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Now, he didn't say some things. We say that. I don't mean me, but I mean the church. 
He said, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them. He didn't say whatever that I have specifically said and this and that and the other. There are principles in his word as well as specific promises. Oh, you say, I don't know about this asking for whatever you desire because maybe my desires would be carnal and that wouldn't please God. Well, my friends, are you're a Christian and you talk that way? I mean, if there's something wrong with your desires, well, then get a new heart. Then your desires will be sanctified and what you ask for, God will give you because I don't come around making the promises. He said, if you delight yourself in me, I will give you the desires of your heart. And you don't delight yourself in God when you're running your own way and doing your own will and seeing how close you can come over to the line called sin without actually touching it. But praise God, there are no limitations in Him. If you delight yourself in me, He said, I will give you what you desire. And when you pray for it, you believe you have received it. He said, if you ask anything according to my will, that's why you have to know His word. He said, I hear you. I want you to know if I hear you. You have, past tense, the petition you desired. We could just go on and on with the promises. No limitations in God. We qualify, we condition. He doesn't. Not those promises. What can you ask for? Let me just give you one right here since we're in Matthew, or we were. Matthew 18, 19. Listen to this. If you have your Bible, turn there because... I've used this countless hundreds of times. I've seen God answer every conceivable kind of need. Matthew 18 and verse 19. Again, I say unto you, I use this everywhere I go for every conceivable need. You can't name a thing I don't believe today that I haven't agreed with people for on this. That's within the scope of Scripture. Again, I say to you that if two of you shall agree Notice there are conditions even in that. Two have to agree. He didn't say pray with a doubter. You never want to agree with somebody who doesn't believe God answers every prayer of faith every time. So there's a condition. If two of you agree on the earth, well, that's easy to meet, that condition, as touching anything. Now, I didn't say anything. He did. Anything. They shall ask it should be done for them by their Father in heaven. What can you ask for on that? I've agreed with people for every conceivable need. A man said, I need $30,000. I said, brother, you got it. I agree with you. That's no isolated case, friends, time and time again. All kinds of sums of money. Not to take out and, you know, misuse. We're not going to get into that. I'm assuming this week we're speaking to Christians who are mature enough that I don't have to digress every time that I talk about money and say, well, now I'm not talking about go out and blow it on a, uh, something or other that wouldn't glorify God. Or to put a million dollars in the bank. I, I agreed with this fellow. This fellow I agreed with with $30, claimed a quarter of a million and got it. You say, what for? He bought a nightclub with it turned it in to a Christian retreat. How about that? Best dance floor in Minnesota is now used for the Lord's work. Praise the Lord. I don't know what the limitations are. I've agreed with eight, ten couples for, who were barren for babies and almost invariably they had children within nine months. Just received a card, a birth announcement from a woman. Said, I'm the one you agreed with. Here was another one. Said the specialist, said, utterly impossible for you to ever bear children. Said, you remember agreeing with me? Well, I didn't remember. I agree with too many people. But she sent the birth announcement. A woman called me on the phone. I heard you speaking down in Louisville. She said that two can agree is touching anything they ask. She says, I desperately need help. Will you agree with me? My father's dying. He just suffered a stroke. He's in a coma. Will you agree that God will... Save his life, spare his life. I said, sister, hang up the phone. I agree with you. It's done in Jesus' name. Several weeks later, I was speaking back somewhere in the city when she came up after. She said, I'm the woman that called. Just had an elderly man with, with her. She said, this is my father. She said, while we agreed, he came out of the coma, got up, went right back to farming. Didn't miss an hour. <laughs> I thank God I can believe it, friends. I have to run around all over the United States and Canada trying to convince children, God's children, that He loves them. I thank God nobody has to convince me that it'll work. I'd be surprised if it didn't. 
I thank God I can believe it. I thank God that I know the tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism. I don't have to spend the rest of my life wondering if I'm speaking in tongues or not. Or if that's just me. Or as the institutional church says, the devil. I know it isn't the devil because I did everything else the devil said to do before I got saved and I never spoke in tongues. <laughs> I'm sure I'd have been speaking in tongues too before I got saved if it's of the devil. But it's God. I thank God I can believe it. Praise the Lord. A woman in Florida said, hearing this same kind of teaching, my husband is going up tomorrow for sentencing. Said he was a leading pusher in this area. Said, Brother Freeman isn't going up to see if he's guilty. He's going up to be sentenced. And you said anything. Well, I didn't say it. God did. And that's within the confines of anything because he'd been saved and baptized in the Spirit since he was arrested. So he qualified. I said, Sister, do you believe it? I said, I've seen God do this before, and I have more than once. Deliver people ready for prison or jail. Deliver them out of the hand of the adversary. Oh, they deserve to go, but they'd gotten saved in the meantime, you see. We're not uh, saying they didn't deserve it. They deserve to go to that prison like we deserve to go to the other prison. But you see, God has mercy on his children, and so none of us are going there if we believe it. And she came back in two days, said, just like we agreed. Came before the judge, and he said, I'm going to do something I've never done. He said, I'm suspending sentence. That's no isolated case. One case we agreed with like that, he went on and sentenced him. Then three days reversed himself. Hallelujah. Praise God that God is not bound by time. Now, I see a lot of you would have given up. You'd say, well, it didn't work, did it? We must have missed it, so we better get on to some other promise. No, I just stayed with it. I've had to wait 30 days sometimes while the devil is all with all kinds of static. Said, you missed it, you've run your faith ministry. I just hold on. Because, friends, I'm not omniscient. I don't know what's going on out there in the circumstances. And God is faithful. I want to testify God is faithful. I want to tell you, if you haven't already heard it, that God says, I'm not a man, I can't lie. I'm not the son of man, I can't repent. If I've said a thing, I'll do it. If I've spoken it, I'll make it good. That's the God I'm talking about. If you ever accuse me of anything this week, accuse me of telling you God's faithful. Because that's my only purpose. A woman up east said, you were up here last year. I said, I see what you're up to. She said, you're trying to get us to believe God's word, aren't you? I said, I plead guilty. I said, that's right. I said, that's all I'm doing. If you go out of here and accuse Brother Freeman of saying anything, go out and charge me with going up and down the land saying that God is faithful, that God will do what He says, that He says if two agree. And what have we agreed for? Well, as I say, I've agreed for every conceivable thing. Oh, a few times I couldn't because, this, like one woman said, do you agree that I sell my resource at a profit? Well, I couldn't agree for that. I couldn't find that in the Word. But that is obvious. I can't agree with you that you'll be a good jockey or a profitable gambler. I can't even agree with people that say, will you agree my husband will be saved this week under this uh, charismatic ministry? No, I, but I always say I'll agree with you that he'll be saved when we pray. It's already done. Mark eleven twenty four. If God wants to work it out this week, all right. I've had to wait a year to see people saved I've agreed for, and sometimes they've gotten far worse than before we agreed. I've learned a long time ago, like the Bible says, don't look at circumstances. Well, here's another promise over in the 21st chapter, Matthew 21, 22. He said, all things you ask in prayer, believing you'll receive. I said, it'd be a whole lot easier to tell you what you can't believe for than tell you what you can believe for. Quit putting limitations on God. There are no limitations in Him. One man was hearing like you're hearing, and he said, oh, no. No, oh, he said... Anything? No. Uh -uh. He came back. I was back there a year later speaking in that city, and he was up giving a testimony. He was shaking his head. He said while I was preaching, I didn't know he was. But he said, I just began to write down all these scriptures he was giving. He says, it wasn't long until I saw that was in the Word. He said, Brother, you talked about God supplying $1,500. He said that was chicken feed. I needed 150000 I was on the verge of bankruptcy. And he said, I'd no sooner thought the thought than you turned over and you said, hey, even if it's 150000 
And he was up giving his testimony and said, I went out and did just what he said. It's in the Word. He said, I got my 150000 I'm still in business. He was a builder. Oh, it just happens all over. Another woman said, don't laugh at me, but I heard you say, Matthew 21, 22, anything. She said, we've got an old pump out of the farm that just keeps disrupting service. It goes out. We have to call the plumber. That's, you know, $20, 30 $40. And she said, last night it went out again. And she said, I had heard you teach that all things you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Well, she said, my husband had to get up, no water to shave and no breakfast and off to work. Wasn't particularly pleased about it. And like it's always, says, well, call the plumber. She said, I got ready to call the plumber after I got up and that came to me what you were teaching, Matthew 21, 22. And so she said, I decided to call the plumber. I went out to the pump, laid my hand on it, and called the plumber. And she said, while my hand was on the pump, she says, don't laugh at me. It started up and still working. Well, praise God. That's no more fantastic than putting gas in empty tanks, having you be the only one who lives on a plane that falls out of the sky. No more fantastic than when our car's overturning and no seat belts. And we know it's overturning, and yet we say that it won't. The angels of the Lord bring it right up the embankment and park it again. He's done that for us. Hallelujah. Just because we believe. The third thing I said for third condition you have to meet, you have to confess it. Romans 10.10, 10, with the heart you do your believing, with the mouth you do your confessing unto receiving. That's a faith principle. I always get blessed. My faith grows every time I hear the word, Romans 10.17, even if I'm preaching it. Isn't that amazing? Well, it shouldn't be. <clears throat> faith cometh by hearing the word. So confess it. It's hard to get Christians to see the value of a positive confession. For example, if you've been prayed for for healing or you've claimed your healing and it's been six weeks and you don't see any marked improvement, you say, Brother Freeman, what's this mean? And I may just ask you, uh, what are you confessing concerning this healing? Often people will say, well, um, I claim my healing and I know God's able and uh, I sure hope I get it soon because I need it. Well, then I will say, well, you won't get healed on that confession because it's not in harmony with the Word of God. You know what it means to confess in the Greek? The word we translate to confess in the Greek means to agree with God. It means to speak the same language. That's what the word we translate to confess means in Greek. If you just translate it as literal meaning, you wouldn't say confess this. You would say agree with God or speak the same word He's spoken. And if you say, I know He's able to heal and hope I get it, that isn't what He said. He said... Not only he's able, but that he will, and that you were healed at Calvary. Enter into your inheritance. This Baptist preacher that got the baptism said, Since you were here, I've never asked for healing. I said, Why? He said, Because of what you said, we were healed at Calvary. And if you've got a Baptist background, a good one, you don't have to say things like that twice to good Baptists. I said, you were healed at Calvary. He said, I just go apply to Calvary every time a symptom comes. He says, I don't pray about it at all. I just claim my healing in Jesus' name. He says, it works the same way. Well, certainly it does. God is trying to get us to the place where we'll confess these things. I prayed for a woman, or started to one time. I said, do you believe God will heal you of this uh, asthma when I pray? Oh, she said, I hope so. Well, I said, I hope so too. But do you believe? Well, she said, that's why I came today. You'd be surprised how many people you can't get them to make a positive confession. See, you're not going to get healed by hoping and saying that's why you came. Well, I said, praise the Lord, that's why you came. I said, do you believe God will heal you when we pray? She said, that's why I'm up here. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I don't spend as much time as I do with some people, but I just persisted in this case. I said, well, <clears throat> took her back into the Word and showed her how to make a good confession. I said, now God wants you to confess you believe you'll receive when I pray. I didn't say it would be manifested. We always look for that. I said, I accept the answer when I pray. I said, now do you believe it? She said, I sure know he's able. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make a good confession. A brother came once with a cancerous growth on his cheek about the size of a large marble. 
He was not charismatic. He didn't know anything about divine healing. He heard one message on faith. I said, Brother, do you believe God will heal that when I pray? He says, I do. I laid my hand on that, and guess what? Took my hand off, still there. I said, do you believe that's healed? He said, I do. I said, go confess it. That will disappear. You confess it. Ten days later, he confessed it for ten days. He was sitting talking to one of our deacons. He felt something there, put his handkerchief up there, and that fell out. There's nothing there now. My point is, he confessed what he didn't possess as far as sight or feeling. I suppose 90% of the people we've prayed for possess it later. Sometimes it's a moment later, sometimes before they get out of the door. We've seen cataracts dissolve on the way home. Or while they're sitting there after you've prayed, praying for someone else. What would these people do if they didn't accept their healing and confess they were healed? I always ask them. If I don't see it right away, I said, do you believe you're healed? I want to hear a good confession. Because I know that nothing's happened until they believe it and confess it and receive it. Fourthly, I said, we have to act <clears throat> like we believe it. This is James chapter 2 and verse 17. He says, faith without corresponding actions is dead. Faith without works is dead. When Jesus anointed the blind man's eyes with clay in John 9, he told him to go wash. We read, he went, he washed, he came seeing. You know why Jesus did that? He didn't always do that. Didn't always heal the blind that way. But he always had ways, by the way. Why did he do that? He gave this man an opportunity to act his faith, that's why. When he healed the ten lepers, he said, Go show yourself to the priests. They were as leprous after he said that as before. For we read, As they went, they saw they were healed, and one rushed back. See, if they had been healed as far as manifestation at first, they would have thanked him there, all ten. You might be surprised, most people are, how many examples there are in the Bible of a manifestation later. It's put there for a purpose. The silly notion that every time Jesus said to a person, you're healed, it was immediately manifested, it will not stand up under Scripture investigation. Both Old and New Testament. And that's one of the things, the keys, the secrets God's trying to get back into His church. To believe He's done it, whether it's the salvation of a loved one, deliverance of an addicted son, a healing or whatever. Believe it's done because He says it's done when you claim it. This is the way faith grows. I'm going to shock some of you and tell you you won't grow one inch in faith on a miracle. And we see miracles, we believe in miracles, and we love to see them, and I never get used to them. But they are given for one purpose, Mark 16, to confirm the word of faith that was just preached. Three people get a miracle, 300 get prayed for, the other majority of the others have to take it by faith. This is the way God is preparing His disciples in this hour. Miracles don't prepare the church. Miracles are a part of the power and ministry of the church. So you have to act like it. And we come to that disturbing uh, statement we made before that if you're going to trust God for healing, then He doesn't need help. He just wants your faith. If you're desperate enough to pray, then He doesn't need pills, He doesn't need surgery, He doesn't need medical techniques, and so forth and so on. I want to say I have no antagonism against medical science. It's for those who do not have faith. It is not for the church. I can say some same things about insurance, but I don't want to get off on that. But you happen to be looking at a person who doesn't need insurance because he has assurance. And when that $10,000 car God gave me by faith went over the embankment and was turning over, oh, I'll tell you, friends, insurance would have comforted my survivors, but assurance comforted me because I knew I couldn't be hurt. Your mind said you're going to be killed. It's going to turn over in your face. Said it can't happen. It didn't. God just put it right back up the embankment. All the power was off. Power steering, power brakes. Five miles an hour. You can't control a car. You know what it is to park one that has all the power off. How about 60 miles an hour down an embankment? God put it right back up on the highway, parked it. He wasn't nervous. I wasn't nervous. <laughs> My wife wasn't nervous. The people who rushed up were nervous. They couldn't understand why we weren't. 
But I don't want to get off an insurance, friends, because that'll just automatically, I guess, come out. That if you have assurance, then you can do just like the early Christians. Shut yourself up to God and trust Him. Terrifying thought to most people, but a very comforting thought for those of us who are walking totally by faith. And we are walking totally by faith. Amen. When you've got assurance, friends, that is a comfort. Hallelujah. Well, back to this business about medicine, which is about as uh, traumatic to think about for most people. God doesn't need it. And you've got to act your faith. Now, I want to say no one can tell you how to act your faith, but God or His Word. If I listened to everyone that told me how to get my healing manifested, my lands, I'd be so confused I'd never get it. All these little helpers that come up and tell me, well, I see legs grow out in my ministry all the time, friends. That hasn't, I say, what's that got to do with me? What's that got to do with my short limb? It was healed in 66. God said you're healed. In fact, he said, don't you even ask or receive prayer. Don't you even ask me about the manifestation. The manifestation is in your body. It'll come forth when I snap my finger. That's all he has to do. That's why we're trying to get you to see, friends, when you get prayed for, whether it's me or anyone else this week, you accept it as done. If it happens right away, praise God, we encourage you to expect an immediate manifestation. But I want to tell you, we've got a ministry that, that you can take with you if it doesn't happen right away. And if you think that isn't producing results, you ought to read our mail. Testimonies of how the messages and the literature has worked out in their lives. And they've seen loved ones saved, whole families coming into the kingdom. Because God said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. You can see your loved ones saved. Don't get off into this business about, well, they have to exercise their will, don't they? Of course they do. Your faith initiates the action. God begins to work in the circumstances of their life. He brings them in. I don't have the time to tell you of all of the cases where this has happened time and again. But you have to act what you say you believe. You let God show you how to act. Some people, every time they see someone in a wheelchair, they want to pray for them. I've had people tell me, Brother Freeman, I don't want to go into any more Karis meetings. They've just worn my head out. They just wear me to death. I was healed at Calvary. I've claimed it. I don't want prayer every time I go to a meeting. I believe I am healed and I'll be out of this wheelchair. A woman said a couple of years ago. And God is manifesting her healing gradually. Why, it was a miracle to even be in a wheelchair. She was totally bedfast. She said, I'm afraid to go in meetings now. Oh, sister, if you'll get out of that wheelchair, God will heal you. Rise in the name of Jesus and walk. Now, listen, if God tells you to tell somebody to do that, it's all right. We were in a meeting where God said, tell the girl to get out. She'll fall, but before she hits the ground, I'll pick her up. She wouldn't believe it. But you better wait until God tells you to tell people to get out of the wheelchairs. Use your faith. You pray for them. I'm not talking about the gifts operating and all that. Uh, we're talking about what we're talking about, where 99% of the body lives. A sister who's a nurse said, Brother Freeman, preach it just like you are because she said, God told me in a direct voice, audible voice, the very thing that you're teaching about, you have to act your faith, that he doesn't heal with medicine. God doesn't need it. Oh, it's ludicrous, friends, to think God needs pills. Praise God, I'll tell you, I just, I have to laugh to keep from crying that Christians think God needs help. You may need it, but he doesn't. No, he doesn't heal through medicine. We're talking about what's in the atonement promised to his children. And she said, I had chronic anemia. This nurse, I had chronic anemia. She said, I went to a charismatic prayer meeting and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Since I began to praise the Lord in new tongues, she said, Jesus appeared to me and pointed right to me and said, you're healed of your chronic anemia. Oh, she said, I didn't know any better than to get up and tell everybody. Well, at a charismatic group, you think you ought to be able to, but I've learned long ago, you don't tell all you know to any group. <laughs> any of you learned that? <laughs> oh, my, you better. It'll cost you a lot till you do learn. She said, the leader of the group said, now, wait, don't do anything foolish. 
She said she knew how bad it was, you know. She said, I would die without the pill. She said, now stay on your pills, and when it's manifested, you won't need to take it. Well, she said, I thought that was strange. If you're healed, what do you need with medicine? But said, I didn't know anything about this. I just received the baptism, and divine healing was a new truth to me. And she said, I thought, well, they ought to know what they're talking about, the leader of the group anyway. So she said, Brother Freeman, I stayed on my medicine, and it got worse and worse and worse and worse. I'd be surprised if you didn't, friend, get worse. And I can tell you a lot of examples besides this one, but there isn't time. I got worse and worse and worse. And she said one day, <clears throat> said, it got so bad I had to sit on the edge of the bed for 30 minutes. After I took my medicine to get enough strength to, just to get up. So one day I was trying to do just a little ironing, couldn't. And she said I just practically collapsed on the ironing board. And she said in desperation, I said, Lord, why did you appear to me? and say I'm healed when I'm not. And she said he spoke again and said, because you don't act like it. I don't know why he would have to say it audibly. It's in his word. Sometimes in his mercy he says it. He says what he's already said in his word. He's going to do that to most of us. She said, do you mean the pills? He said, I mean the pills. My friends, if it's a promise, it's not the pills. It's just that plain. I wish I had the time to tell you what God is revealing by His Spirit to His saints all over the world. He's separating the men from the boys and the women from the girls with this message of faith. Yes, He is. The average charismatic does not go beyond Pentecost. Pentecost is just about where it was 73 years ago. God intends this situation should be corrected. And He's doing it with the word of faith. It separates. And as I travel about the land, I run into all sorts of situations and revelation. God isn't just giving it to me. He's giving it to His people everywhere. And I want to tell you, it is far more severe. It's far more demanding, this end-time walk with God, than most charismatics have any idea. There is going to be a body of overcomers. He's preparing them now. They're going to walk in total faith and total victory. Why well, doesn't do any good to have a ministry if Jordan is flooded and God says go over and deliver the land and you don't have the faith to walk on the water? I'm not using an example. I mean it literally. Your ministry is killed right at the banks of the Jordan. No boats, no bridges. What do you do? With faith, you do what they did in Indonesia. You just keep walking. When the beach runs out, you just keep going. Hallelujah. They didn't know any better than to do that. That's what faith is all about, not knowing any better than to believe God. And he told one another sister, he said to her, now listen to it, some of you can receive it, that's why we're here. He said, if you take one more spoonful of that cough medicine, forget the end time ministry. It's not for you. That's just how narrow it is. God is adding up the fractions now. He's not going to let anything slip by. If you're going to go all the way with Him, I'm not talking about being saved or you can go all the way to heaven talking in tongues, praising God. I'm talking about end time ministry that He's preparing us for. Have you heard there's something besides the gateway experience of the baptism? Yeah, there's something going on, friends. God is getting ready to shake the heavens and earth once more that the baptism is but a threshold into something far deeper. God showed me this in a vision, how that most charismatics step into the spiritual dimension through the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's as far as they go. Praise God, there's something more. So he said, if you want to be healed, then it's me and not the pills. I'm just not going to try to prove that to you, friends. That is just common spiritual logic. And if some of us want to insist that God is still healing by other means, you'll search in vain to find any scripture for that. In fact, I can show you some that would curl your hair if you had any. Like old King Uzziah. You know why he died? The scriptures say because he sought to the physicians and not God for his healing. It's just as plain as day through the scripture. Let the medicine be for those who have no faith. But God forbid that his church should any longer 
never be able to rise above the seat belts and the lightning rods and the insurance and the pills. What did those poor old Christians have to do for the first few centuries? Trust God. Terrifying, isn't it? Well, I'm going to stop with the last condition. Make it brief. Hold fast to your confession of faith. You know why? Hebrews 10, 23 tells you, For God is faithful who made you the promise. That's the key. God is faithful. Some people can claim a promise, confess a promise, act on the promise, and still not get an answer. You know why? They don't hold out to the end till the manifestation comes. Claim a husband who's an alcoholic, his salvation, deliverance, give up an hour, a day, a week, a week too soon. If God allows a trial, if Satan tests them, they can't hold fast. You see, healing is always in response to a confession of faith, but a confession that you can only hold fast to for a day or a week or a month is not a healing confession. D.L. Moody said that a faith that fizzles out at the finish had a flaw in it from the first. <laughs> so if you don't hold fast, there was something wrong to begin with. A woman said to me, oh, that's dishonest for me to say I'm healed. If I'm not, I said, for you it would be. Because if you don't believe it, you're not. We don't want anybody lying, do we? In fact, I went on to tell her, really, it's dishonest for you to say you're not healed when God says you are, if you believe it. That's really being dishonest, because anything that contradicts God's word is dishonest. Hold fast to that confession. I prayed for a young man once that he got worse. That isn't unusual. Sometimes it happens because... Whether or not some of us realize that God sometimes gets things out of our system by making us feel worse. You know, if he wants to do it that way, we'll just have to let him do it. Sometimes cancers pass in a messy, ugly way. Sometimes they evaporate. You know, I can't ever discern why it's that way, one way or another, or ever anticipate which way it'll be. God knows what he's doing. I just believe that. So he got worse. He had a cyst on his back. He said, after you prayed for me, it got worse, began to enlarge. Then he said it began to drain. Boy, he said it would scare you to death to look at it. He said, I was tempted to go to the doctor, but I'd heard you say, hold fast to your confession. So he said, I just kept confessing, kept confessing, refused to look. He said at the end of the 30 days, the trial of my faith was over. He said the thing then began to go down and disappeared. You see, God enlarged it just like a boil to get rid of it. Let us hold fast to our confession of faith without doubting, for he is faithful who made the promise. I wonder if you'd stand with me. Hallelujah. Blessed Lord, we ask you to dismiss us with your love and grace, going with us to such an extent that our words will not have fallen to the ground for any of the hearers, but that we will do as the Bereans search the Scriptures to see that these things are so. Bless and anoint the word to every heart. Our prayer is in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.